buttons. Um, and I'm saying on mute that I was thinking uh, Ginger, Director Cagle, but mostly Carol, Maria, that team, you guys have been amazing. I've never been more prepared for uh, a webinar, except of course, I'm not able to find the mute button. So we left that one off, I guess, all the preparations. Um, thank you guys for having me. Uh, uh, just for the for the group, I'm Michael Call. I'm a, on faculty at the University of Kentucky in the College of Public Health and the Center for Innovation and Population Health. And I have been doing work with LA County for a long time now around this idea of uh, uh, sort of advancing a safety culture into the child welfare space. Um, I was a deputy commissioner in the Tennessee system and we started that work there. Um, so I've really had a, a, a great opportunity to work with your system for gosh now probably five, six years since my first trip out there. So um, plan today is I'm gonna do um, what's become sort of a standard short lecture or talk on what a safety culture is and what it means uh, to, to try to apply that in a, a child welfare context. And we have a couple of activities that some brave folks have stepped forward and agreed to participate with me on. Um, and I think we've got some time built in for questions and, and we'll, uh, I'm happy to field those as well. Uh, it's uh, been interesting for me, someone who's spent a ton of time in the last decade or more uh, up in front of people talking to transition into this new virtual environment and to speak into my computer screen um, at just a couple of faces sometimes, knowing that there's 300 people sitting in LA right now that I'm talking to. So we'll see how it goes, right? Okay, so when we talk about this idea of advancing a safety culture, I'll first sort of ground you in the idea of like, what is a culture and how do we think about culture and what does it mean? Um, you've maybe seen some version of this quote. It's a really great quote, this idea that culture eats strategy for lunch. Basic idea being culture is sort of how we do things. It's how we do things around here. It's our habits. It's how we solve problems. Um, it's not always our best intentions or our strategies or the things that we plan or hope will happen. And oftentimes, culture gets in the way of us actually being successful in implementing some of those new strategies. So um, culture is not this sort of um, abstract idea that we can't understand and change. It's actually measurable and changeable. And so um, given that it lives in our habits and how we do things, we can focus our attention on some very specific things if we want to shift our culture to uh, from where it is now to where we want it to be. So sort of transforming our culture. So what I'm gonna do throughout this talk is kind of come back to this idea that what we're really talking about fundamentally is a change in your culture, which is requiring a change in sort of your paradigm or your lens. Um, sometimes I'll liken it to becoming trauma-informed. So at whatever point in your professional career or, or when your system became trauma-informed, that process becoming trauma-informed um, was more about you changing your viewpoint, your lens, the language you use, the way you talk about uh, an externalizing 13-year-old who's blowing up their placement and who has a trauma history, than it is about you needing to understand the details of trauma-focused CBT or trauma narratives or brain science, right? It's great to know all that stuff, but really becoming trauma-informed was about changing your paradigm. And so changing um, your culture and shifting to this idea of a safety culture, um, really step one is beginning to think about your, largely your workforce and your professionals within your organization differently and thinking about different habits and different approaches to solving problems. So I say all that about culture and this idea that culture eats strategy for lunch, um, but strategy is important too. And you guys have done something absolutely amazing that um, I, I've, I've seen, a few healthcare systems that I've worked with have done this, and it's a really valuable thing. We were able to do it in Tennessee, but from a child welfare jurisdiction's perspective, um, you guys are among a rare set of jurisdictions that have really stepped out front around this idea of a safety culture. You've got this great public-facing strategic plan now that's going to both hold you guys accountable, but also give you a place to hang all this work, right? It gives you a place to put the work that now it's not just a project that um, that Diane's responsible for, but it's a part of your overall mission and your strategic plan. Um, and it's going to be a part of all the accountability models you build around um, satisfying what you now have obligated yourself to by virtue of putting this stuff out there. And so, you know, right there in an important spot along your foundational pillars is this idea of developing a safety culture. Um, 
what kind of organizational culture does LA County want to have? And you're being explicit about it. And, and what you're saying is, as, as Director Cagle said, is you're recognizing in saying this and doing this work that um, child welfare is a safety critical uh, industry uh, in the same way that aviation and healthcare and nuclear power and some of these other places we look to are. Our professionals are making the same kind of high risk, high consequence decisions all day long that pilots and nurses and surgeons are making, right? So it stands to reason our organizations would benefit from some of the same strategies and tactics that those settings have been using now for decades to make not only their services or their care delivery more safe and effective, but to support a different kind of workforce, um, a different set of professionals that are both safe and engaged in the work they do and more effective and reliable at the services they deliver. So, Again, I can't say enough how impressed I am. And these two slides that I just went through with you that calls out this idea that you guys have a safety culture as a pillar, a foundational pillar of your strategic plan. Um, well, Diane and, and Cynthia Wong and I have presented this in a couple of different conferences, but I present these slides now all over the country. It's really, really an impressive step. So what is a safety culture? So what we're talking about when we're talking about the particular kind of culture that you would put into one of these high risk, high consequence, safety critical settings is a culture that learns from this idea of safety science. It applies safety science to create this kind of culture that we wanna create. And so if safety culture acknowledges the high risk nature of an organization, so we say that out loud, this is a high risk organization um, and it works to achieve consistently safe outcomes. So you begin then shifting your resources towards those things that create safe, reliable outcomes. Promotes a blame-free environment. Um, again, as Director Cagle said, uh, some of these other industries learned um, a, a long time ago that shaming and blaming people doesn't motivate safe behavior and it doesn't help your system learn and get better. And so you've got to build quality improvement processes that are about learning, um, supporting and improving and accountability. This is not about not having accountability in your system. It is recognizing that shaming and blaming um, people within a really complex system doesn't get you where you wanna go. It encourages collaboration across ranks. I'm gonna talk a little bit today about collaborative decision-making and the role of teams in a safety culture. I think this is a really important thing for us to grapple with in child welfare. Um, most of our child welfare systems don't organize themselves into team. We might do something called teaming, and I know you guys are rolling out a new practice model over the last couple of years, and, LA that has a, as part of it child and family teams. That's not um, specifically the kind of teaming I'm talking about. I'm kind of I'm talking about the kind of teaming that goes on in the cockpit or in the operating room where peers and professionals um, work together with some very specific strategies to build habits that make them more effective and safe. And it's recognizing that um, collaborative decision making is just the more effective, safe decision making model for settings like ours. It's it's not safer for only the surgeon to be making decisions about a patient's safety in the OR, or only the pilot making decisions about the safety of the aircraft. Um, they know they need to depend on a team to help them stay safe. And then finally, it's about doing what you guys are doing. You're, you're sort of walking the walk, you're committing resources um, to safety concerns in your setting. And when I talk about safety, um, I'm not talking about just child safety absolutely important strategic goal for all of our systems across the country, but I'm talking about um, safety more broadly as an as a emergent property of your system. And so this is to include your pro professionals, safety of your professionals. And I'll actually talk a fair amount about that today. And so, as I said, um, when you're talking about a safety culture, we're gonna talk about the way teams function in a safety culture in a very particular kind of way. And so leaders in a safety culture, um, have a very specific set of responsibilities to create that kind of blame-free culture that we want to create. It's about accountability, but not about shaming and blaming. Um, it's about learning, uh, not about assuming if we um, just move past that problem because we've fired someone or we've trained a bunch of people, somehow we'll prevent it from happening the next time. So leaders in a safety culture strive to balance systems accountability and individual accountability. When is this a systems issue? And when is this about individual uh, culpability or accountability? They value open communication, transparency, and they seek to develop a continuous learning and improvement model. And I know you guys are doing a ton of work right now to build out um, 
under Roxana's leadership, this new CQI division that I think is going to be um, really, really fantastic. And then teams in a safety culture do some really specific things, and we talk about um, developing a core set of habits that support this kind of activity. So they monitor themselves, their colleagues, and their systems for signs of stress. This is what it means to be resilient on a team. And then they anticipate and respond to unexpected events, and then they can come back to normal operations as a unit. And so this is what it means to be a leader in a safety culture and what it means to be a member of a team in a safety culture. And so what we then need in the interest of sort of shifting this lens, creating a new way to think about um, your culture, is a way of thinking differently about um, humans and how they make decisions inside complex systems. And so, as I said, we're shifting um, very intentionally away from this idea that we can learn and get better if we um, single out the people who did something wrong, identify the policy they violated, train people on a new policy, sanction the professional if that's necessary. We're shifting to a model that says, let's understand more deeply how people make decisions and what things influence the way they make decisions so we can back up from that and design a system that helps people make good decisions a system that prevents them from making bad decisions when possible, right? So how do we engineer our system more effectively to support better decision-making so we can get better outcomes? And so too often we boil down these processes to thinking about good and bad choices. Um, somebody either went left or they went right and that decision resulted in the outcome they wanted or didn't. It boils down simply to the decision maker and the decisions they made. And what I'm gonna go through now in a series of slides is sort of line up the argument for why that's an oversimplification in your system and why you need to think differently about humans making decisions in your complex system. So the last time I, like before we all shut down, the last time I had the opportunity to come out to um, Los Angeles when I was pulling into uh, the, the parking spaces there at Shadow Place, I was pulling in right behind Director Cagle. And like I saw him hanging out of his car, you know, it was, he must have just pulled away from the gas pump and pulled out the little handler. And I'm thinking, God, he seems like a pretty smart guy. I can't believe he would do something like that. What a, you know, what a silly thing to do this morning. So this is an example of fundamental attribution error. This is a, an example of a set of cognitive biases that we all bring um, with us to our work because we're human. When I saw Director Cagle's car in the, in the parking lot, I thought, gosh, what, what was he thinking? Like, it, it's so obvious that he should have put it back on the pump before he drove away. But what I know is that if I was in his situation and I had done that, I would have a hundred reasons why it happened. I would rationalize the decisions I made. I would know that I was distracted because um, we had a really busy morning getting our kids out the door, or I just got a call from my wife and my kids headed to the ER and I was thinking about other things, or I've got a really big meeting that I'm heading to and I was just off that morning. So when fundamental attribution error is, again, is one of these cognitive biases that we all bring to our work, that tells us, I don't know what this is, um, that, that has us attributing to other people's behaviors, their preparation or their intent or their character or their judgment. But when we do it, we rationalize it, right? It's when you cut someone off on that insane freeway that you guys have out in Los Angeles. And when you do it, it's like, oh, sorry, I didn't see you. But when someone else does it, right? They're a jerk. You're going to shake your fist at them. So this is fundamental attribution error. And it's critical to us shifting our lens towards one that understands the complexity of decision making, because it tells us that, in fact, people make decisions because those decisions made sense to them at the time. Um, and there's all kinds of things influencing the way they make those decisions. And so if we're in a situation where we're looking back at someone's work or evaluating another professional's work, we need to understand this idea of fundamental attribution error. Confirmation bias um, if you do assessment or investigation work, this may be something you're familiar with. Again, it's a bias, a cognitive bias that we're all wired with. This is the idea that I'm going to seek out the data that confirms my own assumptions. Um, I'm going to be more inclined to find information that supports the way I feel about a family or the, the things that I've already sort of thought happened in that house before I go in. We're all wired that way. We're going to discount um, disconfirming data, and we're going to overvalue that data that confirms our assumptions. And so we need to be aware of confirmation bias in our teams, and we need to build systems to help them uh, mitigate those effects. Selective attention. Selective attention is the bias that is, if I give you a very specific task, 
Um, if you've ever seen this this um, little clip of the, the gorilla walking across the stage, uh, it's an example of selective attention. Uh, the, the, the video is, uh, I think, four kids on a stage bouncing a basketball. The narrator says, count the number of times they pass the ball. So I've given you a very specific task. And then about halfway through, a person in a gorilla suit walks across the stage. And about half of you would miss the gorilla if I showed the video to you and gave you that task. It's the same um, bias that has us focused head down on the investigation and missing all the other risks in the house when we walk in. Um, you guys have that really amazing simulation lab. What Some of the things I love about it is when you go into some of the rooms, like I remember the one room that has two bedrooms and like a kitchen, it's kind of the main sim room. There'll be things like a blanket laying on the heater. Um, so I'm there to talk to mom or I'm there to, you know, as part of the investigation to talk to the kiddo, but I need to be able to see all the other things going on in the room, right? I've got a very specific task, but I've got to also notice that there's a blanket laying on the heater. Hindsight bias and severity bias sort of work together, and they're really important cognitive biases to understand, both in our work with kids and families, but also um, if we're in a role, which all of you, I think, are in some sort of leadership, administrative, or supportive role, so all of you probably at some time are in the position, even if it's just an annual performance about, of looking back at other professionals' work and making a judgment about it. And so hindsight bias is that bias that says, once I know the outcome of an event, in our child fatality reviews, we talk a lot about it. Once I know the kids died, I'm prone, I'm wired as a human to look back at all the things that led up to that moment in time and put them together in some logical way that didn't actually occur um, in real time. The people getting up and working that case, of course, did not know that kid was going to die at the end of the day. And so knowing the outcome biases you towards looking back in hindsight and making assumptions about the decisions that were made. We counter that by thinking about this idea of local rationality. And that's the idea that people make the decisions they make because it makes sense to them at the time. Otherwise, they would make different decisions, right? Doesn't mean good or bad. It just means if it didn't make sense, they would have made other decisions. I'm afraid I'm frozen. Okay, am I, did I freeze up a minute, Ginger? Oh, good, okay. Seemed like you guys did for a second. The related bias, severity bias, is the idea that when there's a bad outcome, when there's a bad event in our case practice, when there's a child fatality or some other thing that happens, um, we assume that the actions that led to it must have been sort of proportionately severe, right? Bad outcome, bad things must have happened. I've done hundreds and hundreds of reviews now, I've been a part of reviews across the country, um, what we really know is there's there's good casework goes on all day long, and kids still unfortunately die in our caseload. Bad casework happens all day long, and we stumble into good outcomes. If you're looking for that relationship, you're not bringing um, with you a lens that's really about learning. So these are the cognitive biases that we bring to us, uh, bring with us to our work that affect the way we make decisions in this sort of complex setting of child welfare. We also know that we get exposed to a lot of stuff in child welfare, and specifically, we have a really pretty good understanding now of, of the exposure um, that our professionals experience around other folks' trauma, so secondary trauma, and even primary trauma in some of our uh, work, and the impact that can have on us. And this, um, if you've seen this before, this is this sort of hierarchy of stress I borrow from the Harvard Center for Developing Children, that they use to describe the adverse childhood experiences work they do. But the, the, there's the same body of literature that exists for people working in the kinds of roles that our child welfare professionals are working in, um, police, fire, uh, the military, that describes this same sort of thing, which is to say that there's positive stress, there's the kind of stress that seeing the snake cross the road in front of you uh, causes your pupils to dilate and you get a little burst of adrenaline so you can protect yourself. That's positive temporary stress. But then there's these ideas of tolerable and toxic stress and what mitigates the two. And tolerable stress is serious, temporary, but buffered by supportive relationships. And this is really critical because this is what we do with kids and families, right? We go in and we're there to help them with this transformation, help them to get from where they are now to where they need to be. And we wrap meaningful adult relationships around kids and families by virtue of bringing in uh, resources because we know that buffers against this tolerable stress at the moment. Then we know that it can switch over into toxic stress absent those bufferings and become prolonged stress um, without protective relationships. And this is what we see in the workplace. 
what we know about uh, research on stress in the workplace in, in some of these other professions like police, fire, um, the military, is that the primary thing that buffers against the effects of stress um, and burnout are meaningful adult relationships, being connected to the folks you work with, liking your colleagues. That's the most effective buffer we have against the effects of stress and burnout in the workplace. So we know cognitive biases affect the way we make decisions. Uh, we know that we get exposed to levels of trauma that can affect the way we make decisions. And then we know we deal with burnout. Um, this was done in an activity at Vanderbilt when we had a summit and invited a bunch of jurisdictions. You guys came. And the uh, he was a physician, but he was facilitating an activity for us in the afternoon where he had everyone draw um, themselves when they were doing work, uh, when they were actually doing work in the field, uh, burnout. What does it look like when you're burnout? And so um, facing the screen on the left, I, I like the one with the, he's pointing you and it looks like there's a kid laying on the floor with his hair on fire. Somebody's leaving. Um, audio suckers, like I'm out of here. Then the one on the right, I think is really good too. I, I'm fine in the bubble cloud, crazy hair, case plan, the kids saying what's happening. Um, so we all know what burnout looks like, right? We know the literature is pretty solid. Uh, anywhere from 45 to 65 percent of child welfare professionals will be burnt out at any point in time when you survey them. That's really consistent with the data we have. We do a lot of um, organizational assessment around the country, surveys similar to the one that you guys did in advance of this talk, um, and, and that's where it hangs out for us too. It's around 45 to 65 percent burnout in child welfare. So we know it's a big risk for us. Uh, it's the case in all helping professions. Nurses and doctors have the same levels of burnout. Um, the interesting thing about these drawings when people do them, um, if you have any sort of experience with or come from a tradition that uses like art therapy or, or art to get kids to communicate, um, when you see someone drawing themselves without hands and feet, it, it communicates powerlessness. And so in, in uh, each of the drawings, the sort of primary figure, the one leaving the exit and the one dragging the kid has no feet, uh, whereas other people in the drawings have feet and hands. So we know we bring cognitive biases that affect the way we make decisions. Um, we know that we're exposed to um, other folks' trauma and that can affect the way we make decisions. And then we know burnout is really important in our work uh, and, and it can impact the way we make decisions. And it can impact how long we stay in the work. All of these things can. And leaving the work um, quickly means we develop a workforce that doesn't have a lot of experience. And we know we deal with that too in child welfare. And I think underappreciated influence on our decision-making in child welfare, but that's actually very well understood in places like aviation and healthcare is the role of fatigue. Um, I can't remember, and you can nod, Ginger, but do you guys have a second shift that you can hand a call over to? Or is it the case that if I were to catch an ER late in the afternoon, um, I might be in the emergency room all night? You might be in the emergency room all night. Yeah, and that's typical in most child welfare systems. Um, it's the case that uh, we might get caught out late, we might get called out late, and we might be out all night. And in most systems, if it's not explicitly a part of policy, it's at least the cultural expectation. Certainly it was this way in Tennessee that you would be at work the next day because if you weren't there to manage your caseload, if you weren't there to go represent your families in court, someone else was gonna have to do it and everybody's busy, right? And so I think unlike some of these other safety critical settings that um, have wrestled with this idea of fatigue, pilots can't just fly as long as they want to. A, a pilot has effectively a pitch count, a number of hours they're allowed to fly and then they're pulled off the airplane. Um, we don't have that same sense in most child welfare systems. I think we underappreciate the role of fatigue in our work. Were you going to say something, Carol? Is everything okay? Okay, good. I was. I, I worry that I'm frozen or something's going on. Um, and so this is uh, the slide I've got up now has uh, is from a study, a functional MRI study. Functional MRIs are are like MRIs, those those imaging studies that you can do. A functional one just allows you to do tasks while you take the image. So we can isolate very specific parts of your brain that we know are related to certain things. And so what this study told us was that uh, the slides on the top, the photos on the top, the images, are sleep control. So people who had a normal eight hours of sleep. And the slide on the bottom were folks who were up for about 24 hours or the sleep deprived brains. 
And what you see on the sleep deprived brains are those emotional control centers are much larger and brighter, right? They're lit up like they're on fire. Those emotional control centers look like an MRI of an adult schizophrenic. And so when we've been up all night, we know that we have hyperactive, ineffective emotional controls. We also know that this sort of um, metaphorical leash that connects those emotional control centers to our executive functioning part of our brain gets temporarily severed. And so we're not connecting our emotions with good decision making after we've been up all night. And I'm sure that uh, either in a work context or um, after a long weekend with family, uh, we've all experienced that sort of emotional ability of uh, being tired and snapping at someone or not making our best decisions or being our best self, right? So we've got to understand that that affects the way people make decisions and do their work. So we know we've got cognitive biases that our professionals bring. We know that uh, we expose them to levels of stress that can present like clinical symptoms, like a PTSD presentation. Um, we know that burnout is a big deal in child welfare. And then we um, need to develop a better appreciation for the role of fatigue. And so in our systems, historically, what we've done in child welfare is, is some version of a take care model, a wellness model, um, a, a strategy that says we can somehow build into our workforce some new capacity that makes them more resilient and effective in the face of all these things that our work is doing to them, right? Um, we know our professionals are exposed to a lot of stuff. They bring a lot of stuff with them. Um, and to date, we haven't had a lot of really good strategies for how to manage all that stuff and the way that it affects their decision making toward better outcomes. And so specific to things like burnout and exposure to secondary trauma, um, we mostly have employed strategies that are about wellness and building resilience into our workforce. They have value. There's certainly value in those strategies. Um, but they frankly don't have a ton of evidence yet and, and haven't gotten us as an industry very far down the road. As I said, that number of 65% burnout, that's a really stable number over a couple of decades of studying child welfare professionals. And in fact, if you go do a lit search right now on burnout and child welfare, you don't see a lot of very recent research because we just haven't moved the needle. It, it's not um, very interesting to go look at it anymore because we're not being very effective at improving it. And so um, our current approach to either um, either or building in a wellness model or take care model and responding when someone's had stress, they've had a critical incident and we're gonna um, bring in the critical incident debriefing team and we're gonna refer them for EAP if they need it. Those are all critical strategies. I wanna be clear in saying that, but they're not enough. And so what I would challenge us to think about is a different approach to thinking about resilience in our system. And so there's this metaphor that gets used a lot in sort of the wellness world, this idea of taking care of yourself before you take care of the kid next to you on the airplane, the oxygen mask metaphor. It says, if I'm gonna take care of people, if I'm gonna be a helper or a caregiver, I need to first take care of myself, right? So that I have the capacity to take care of them. And so we like to extend this metaphor a little bit. So the idea is put the oxygen mask on yourself before you put it on the kid to your next to you. But what happens in those briefings that the um, flight attendant gives you is um, they don't say if you've become confused and lightheaded and the kid next to you has started turning blue, um, push a couple of buttons and pull a lever and that will trigger the system that will drop the oxygen mask down in front of you. They don't do that because they know when you're oxygen deprived, when the cabin has become depressurized, you don't have the capacity to make all those decisions. You're in the soup and you need the system to make decisions for you. So they've engineered the airplane to drop that oxygen mask down in front of you because the plane knows you need it, because it cabin has depressurized and it knows you might need oxygen. Commercial airlines fly at about 35,000 feet. It's like being on top of Mount Everest, right? So they don't ask you as the human in that situation to make a set of decisions so that you can get help. They engineer the plane to know when you need it. And so from that perspective, we should be pushing ourselves to think about resilience as a property of our system, not as a, some capacity that we can build into the humans in our system. Um, certainly, there are things we should be doing to help with that, but really what we should be doing is looking for opportunities to engineer our system more smartly so we can, one, help our professionals not make um, bad decisions or help them make good decisions, um, and two, 
help them stay in the work long enough to develop the experience they need to be really effective at what they want to do. Um, we lose lots of people because of these things too early in their career before they're able to develop the experience that we need them to develop. So I'm going to make this point in a slightly different way. Um, imagine this is our newly minted child welfare professional. Um, we've just hired them in Tennessee. We, we, uh, they may have a history degree and we might have hired them because they raised their hand and they say, okay, we'll take the job. Um, because that's another issue we deal with in child welfare is that we don't have a large pre-professionally trained workforce. Um, people like nurses and pilots and surgeons who've trained for a long time before they come to the job to pull from, we pull from a variety of different disciplines, people with a lot of different degrees who are interested in coming doing the work, and then we train them to go do it. And so we have our newly minted child welfare professional. We've just hired them, brought them into our system. We know they're going to get expo exposed to a lot of stress on the job, some of it traumatic, some of it just the stress of the work. Um, they're going to be exposed to trauma. Uh, we're going to keep them up all night, so fatigue will be an issue for this professional. Um, and we know they bring to the work a set of cognitive biases that affect the way they make decisions. It affects the work they do with us. And then we're going to drop them into this space that our human factors colleagues call work as imagined. This is um, how we drew it up. Um, this is all of our strategies and our policies and our practices, right? This is a bunch of smart people in a room um, thinking about how things should work uh, when we uh, put them out into the world. But we know that's not realistic, right? So work as imagined is this ideal space that doesn't really exist anywhere. And so what we know actually happens is we begin, once we've dropped this child welfare professional into this space, dealing with things like budget cuts and service ready limitations and limited resources. We're in the public sector frequently asked to do more with less. And all this stuff sort of presses in on um, our newly minted child welfare professional. And then we know we have operational constraints that also similarly press in on our professional's ability to do the work. Um, we know we can have high caseloads in some jurisdictions. Um, turnover is probably an issue in LA County. Um, that puts a lot of pressure on the system because those cases don't go away. We've got to figure out how to manage them. Um, I assume you guys have figured out the paperwork problem, right? So that's not a problem in LA County. And so paperwork is a big dissatisfier and it gets in the way of our professionals doing the kind of work that they came to us to do, right? They came to us to engage with families um, not to do tons and tons of paperwork. And that, that exists in a lot of industries, but it certainly plagues child welfare. So we know all these sort of things sort of conspire to press in on this space that we drew up, the space that we thought would be the most effective way to work in our system. And it pushes our child welfare professionals out towards what we call the margin of error to this space where errors can happen, sort of the failure point. Um, again, in the interest of not limiting our understanding of decision making and um, practice variability in our systems to just one professional making a decision, we need to understand a model like this. We need to understand that this is a professional working in a big space that pushes in from all sides and impairs their ability sometimes to make the right decision, or even they're making the right decisions, but those decisions are not leading to the kinds of outcomes we want. And so what, um, what we call high reliability organizations, these organizations that are able to stay right inside this margin and develop the kind of culture we're talking about today, develop a safety culture. What they're able to do is put in place very specific strategies and build into their teams a very specific set of habits to keep them right inside this margin. They do things like uh, in the operating room, uh, it, it used to be the case that oxygen tubing and anesthesia tubing was exactly the same size. And although they were different colors, the ports on the wall were exactly the same size. So it was the case for a long time in operating rooms that you could connect oxygen tubing to an anesthesia port um, by accident in a really busy, complex setting like an OR. And if you're a patient who needs oxygen, um, getting anesthesia is a bad outcome, right? So they do things in operating rooms like create hard stops. They now make different size tubing. The tubing is not the same size and the ports are not the same size. So you can't physically attach the oxygen tubing to the anesthesia port or vice versa, right? So 
that setting understands the kind of things they need to do to help professionals in a busy setting when um, it can be very stressful and tense and sometimes even hostile and they need to make good decisions, they know that they need to put in place things, right? When Sully Sullenberger uh, landed his airplane on the Hudson, he didn't rely on his, he, this, he said this in every interview he did afterwards, some version of this, he didn't rely on his own sort of heroism and super pilot skills. He relied on the fact that he had simulated that landing throughout his entire career in a, in a flight simulator. And he knew his team had done the same thing. And he knew that he was going to reach up and pull down a checklist and he was going to follow that checklist um, to help him land that airplane. Because when that started happening, he couldn't rely on his own decision making. He needed a system that was helping him be um, successful and resilient in the face of unexpected events. Um, in a couple of examples in child welfare, putting in place, for example, dealing with fatigue, putting in place a policy that says, um, in Tennessee, we're a long, narrow state. And um, it's the case that if you're in the uh, sort of north, the, the furthest um, northeast corner of the state, you can get to parts of Canada quicker than you can get to Memphis on the western part of the state. But we have a lot of kids placed in the Memphis area. And so we learned from work, some of our organizational assessment work and a confidential reporting system we developed that um, it was the case that sometimes our child welfare professionals would drive all day long to place a kid or to check on a kid in Memphis. And then the expectation, again, culturally, the expectation was that they were going to drive all the way back that day. Um, putting them late into the night after a full day of driving. And in fact, in one of our um, uh, one of our confidential re safety reports that we received, uh, one of our professionals said, if not for the rumble strips on the highway, I would be dead. And so that as a leader is really chilling to read something like that. And, and knowing that there's both a pull per personally, people just wanna get home and get in their bed. And I understand that, but then professionally, you know, if they're not back at work the next morning, again, someone else has to do their work and two, they don't want to necessarily negotiate with fiscal for a hotel room or call their supervisor and ask if it's okay if they stay in Memphis. And so we put in place effectively a hard stop, a hard stop like not being able to connect oxygen tubing to the anesthesia board. And we said, if your workday is going to take you beyond a certain number of hours, I think it was 13, um, and, um, you have to have a co-driver with you and you have to have a hotel room at the other end. You don't have to negotiate with your supervisor or with fiscal. It's a hard stop. You don't get the discretion to make the decision to come back because it's not safe. So there's opportunities for us to think like these other settings and build in these sort of hard stops that just prevent bad decision making, that help people make safer decisions. And so the work we're doing um, uh, with systems and with you guys and nationally through this national partnership, um, it, it falls into sort of three interrelated strategies that we draw on that we've pulled from uh, the literature around safety science and working in high reliability organizations. Um, it's first developing a systems focused improvement model. And you guys have really leaned into that like no other system. Um, we start with every jurisdiction, helping them build out their approach to child fatality reviews. Uh, you guys are a part of now this National Partnership for Child Safety that is a, a national quality improvement collaborative modeled after um, other industry national quality improvement collaboratives that are going to have us all sharing our child fatality review data for the purposes of learning. So child fatalities are fortunately rare events in all of our systems. They're a low base rate event. And so what we want to do is bring together a bunch of jurisdictions. We're at 17 right now. We expect to be at 24 by next year and 30 by the end of next year. So, and it's big, really forward thinking, um, uh, innovative jurisdictions like LA County and New York City and uh, Wisconsin. And so it's really exciting to have these jurisdictions involved and, and engaged in this opportunity to um, learn about safety science, develop a particular kind of culture, but then share this important safety related data for the purposes of learning. So we're working with systems on systems focused improvement models. To be systems focused is really just thinking about um, not the components in your system specifically, like is, is one component broken? Do we have a problem with our, our professionals and the way they do investigations? Um, but rather thinking about all the components in our system, how they work together 
And what are those emergent properties that come from those interactions that we need to pay attention to? That's what it means to think about something from a systems perspective. So we start with child fatality review, but we're trying to push all of our jurisdictions to move this information out into their broader quality improvement work. And you guys have done that from day one as you build out this new division of uh, this new QI division. Um, we do organizational assessment with all jurisdictions. Two of the scales that I sent you um, that we're going to look at the res uh, results of later um, are two of the scales that we use with jurisdictions around the country. Um, we measure things like safety, um, uh, uh, like psychological safety, this idea, am I, do I feel accepted, respected, part of a team, free to speak up and take your own personal risks. Um, this is what it means to be on a team that doesn't, uh, that uses mistakes or errors as learning opportunities. It's not about shaming and blaming. So uh, really critical foundational stuff like that. We measure this idea of mindful organizing that I'll talk about a little bit later that's a team-based construct. It's not um, mindfulness from the sort of Eastern tradition, but it's about how a team comes together, organizes to anticipate and respond to unexpected events, and then come back to being resilient. Um, so we use organizational assessment in a very particular way uh, to do what we're going to do in just a minute, which is to start a conversation. We don't think of our organizational assessment tools as being the answer to any problems. Um, they're conversation starters. They help us unpack things about our system, but they also really importantly help you develop a language, and language drives culture. So in as much as you guys have now this explicit strategic goal around a safety culture, the kind of culture you want to develop, um, having these data would be really valuable for you in your efforts and like developing a new language, a new way of talking. Again, going all the way back to my first slide, you're in the process of shifting your lens or changing your paradigm. And so um, a part of that, in the same way that we talk differently about kids and families from a trauma-informed perspective, uh, if you want to develop this thing we call a safety culture, you need a new language, a new way of thinking and talking about it. So we use organizational assessment in a very particular sort of way when we work with jurisdictions. Um, and then finally, as I said, teams play a really important role. How do we organize our professionals to work in teams? And so we, and um, culture exists in our habits. And so we think we can bring a set of uh, really simple, uncomplicated tools uh, that are um, have been proven to work in other safety critical settings. And I think actually um, this afternoon, or the, or I mean, the, it's going to be afternoon for me, but the rest of the talk will sort of be focused on this idea of tools for teams. Um, uh, these tools support habit development. So if culture lives in your habits, how you do things, the tools that we're borrowing from other places like aviation and healthcare are these very simple kind of blocking and tackling of teamwork that'll help your professionals develop the kind of habits that lead to more safe, effective, reliable care delivery. So it's things like huddles and debriefs, like how do you use something as simple as that? And so that work came out of crew resource management and how um, teams work in the cockpit and how they interact on airplanes to keep planes more safe, because planes are mostly an engineering problem. About 90% of the safety concerns can be engineered out of an airplane. Um, and, and then whatever percentage is left over is about how the humans interact with that plane. So crew resource management was the curriculum that helped them deal with that, using things like huddles and debriefs and timeouts and checklists, things that you've probably heard of. So healthcare started using those tools, and they developed a curriculum called Team Steps. It, it uses all those same strategies, but fits it for a healthcare context. We had the opportunity to work with KC Family Programs on a year-long breakthrough series collaborative to develop what we call the Team First Field Guide, which is just an adaptation of all those strategies, um, but fit for a child welfare context. And so we have teams all over the country now doing things like huddling um, when they think a removal is coming or debriefing after uh, things have gone uh, the way they didn't expect once they've gone to court. So just using these very specific strategies, simple stuff, not a new practice model, just really simple stuff to help you develop the kind of habits that we think support um, safe and effective care delivery. And so I'll be, we'll be unpacking that a little bit when we get to uh, after I think the activity that we do last slide. And I'm a little bit ahead on time, I apologize. So we'll have a little time for questions. Dr. Cole, this is Maria from the chat box. We have a few comments in the chat box to share with you. Okay. Um, not everyone is talking. Uh, we're on fire. So Carla H says to everyone, fantastic work. Dr. Cole, do you also train attorneys? Uh, this body of work is super relevant. What we would give to have you testify as an expert witness on all of our litigated cases. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, we, I mean, we interact a lot with attorneys. Um, the, it, this does, I mean, it, I think a lot of attorneys hear this stuff um, and it just makes sense to them, like it resonates. Um, and especially, I mean, just, you know, I, Diane called it, I think, the elephant in the room when we did a talk together and she made a slide uh, about the Netflix documentary. But when you guys have been through something like you've been through, um, creating a culture like this is so important and, and probably makes a ton of sense. Um, but yeah, oh. we, we love to have, because uh, there's this idea of just culture I know that emerges too, that's really um, overlapping with this work, um, but that I think exists a, a lot in, in, with attorneys and comes from that tradition. Do I, am I reading the questions or Maria, are you going to? I'm going to uh, share the comments with you. We also have another comment with from Maria Hovacinian. And, uh, you know, your slides are in high demand. A lot of people have been asking for them. Uh, but she also writes, amazing job. I love the way the doctor explains the materials. I love it when people call me doctor as if I have any skills that extend into, like, taking care of people. Not that kind of doctor. And, uh, oh, thanks. I, yeah, I'm, I'm obviously happy to share anything I have. So. Um, all my slides are yours, and um, all the materials we use in the partnership, I, we can send around to the things that I reference, like the, the survey tool might be interesting, um, and the field guide. Okay, then we also have comments from Brian Bruckner, Jennifer Lopez, um, Lavanya, all to the effect of uh, presentation was thought out, organized, delivered, very well, very informative, nice presentation. Um, I have Diane saying Michael Rocks, all in caps. Yes, Michael Rocks. So um, those are the type of comments that are coming in in the chat box. Great, yeah, I'm, I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad it was useful. Um, it's um, it's not nearly as fun, um, although I enjoy seeing Maria's face and, and Carol's face. It's not nearly as fun talking to WebEx as it is being in person. And LA is one of my favorite places to, to visit. Um, uh, Dr. Cole, also, there is a, a question from uh, Terry Gillums. Uh, she mentions that you uh, made reference to a Casey tool. She wanted to know if you could please name that tool again, please. I wonder if that was the field guide. Is, was it um, when I said we worked with Casey Family Programs on a Breakthrough Series Collaborative to develop? Um, that would be the field guide, and I'm happy to share that. I think that's probably what, what you're thinking of. And Luis Vald Valdovinos just said, great presentation. Our staff and leaders should make actionable uh, talks, deliverables, and practices. Yeah, and we're going to talk in our, our panel this um, in a minute uh, it is going to be about sort of what, what are some specific things we can do. And then I do have one last question. Is can you speak on what it looks like to hold a colleague accountable versus shaming and blaming? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question because there, there is some stuff in the uh, um, in the field guide about that, how do you have sort of hard conversations? Uh, just a couple of simple tools for having those hard conversations. Um, so I would say that I would break that into two things in a way, like holding a colleague accountable is actually a really important part about building a psychologically safe setting. Psychological safety is not about feeling comfortable and happy all the time. Sometimes psychological safety is about having a hard conversation and and bringing up to someone that um, you've noticed that something they're doing is sort of not what you would expect from them, right? Uh, we have a, I have a colleague at Vanderbilt that developed this thing called um, cup, of, cup of coffee conversations. And, and there's a ton of health systems now around the country that use their system. But it's just this idea about how do you go have a quick conversation? It's not therapy. Deliver candid, important feedback to somebody. And then be safe walking away from it. And they're, they're also receiving it in a way that, um, that they know that it's about learning and improving, but not about shaming and blaming. And so that's, you know, that's, again, creating a psychologically safe team or context is not about everybody feeling happy and comfortable all the time. In fact, it's oftentimes about being comfortable with discomfort because you have to be able to bring up problems on your team to talk about them. Um, the original research on psychological safety done by Amy Edmondson at Harvard was she was asked to go in and look at uh, a set of, uh, look at, uh, the, uh, the Harvard system, I assume, um, look at error reporting in on hospital units and to determine whether or not re reported errors was connected to outcomes on the units, right? The units who report more errors, medication errors, falls, pressure ulcers, those kinds of things that get reported have worse outcomes. And what they found was the inverse. That in fact, high reporting 
on units uh, equated to better outcomes on units. And that was at the time they were like, well, that makes absolutely no sense. Our data must be off. Um, what they found when they went in and started looking more deeply at these units that were getting good outcomes was that this idea of psychological safety, the idea that because they were able to surface problems, talk about them and feel more comfortable reporting them, got them to better outcomes. The units that didn't report and didn't talk about their problems were not getting good outcomes. And so, you know, this idea of holding people accountable and creating psychological safety is really interrelated. Um, uh, it, psychological safety is about being accountable. And then I said I was going to split that in half, and I'm, I'm saying a lot of words to answer this question, but it's a really good question. Um, the other thing about that is then how do we build our systems to hold people accountable differently and not shame and blame? So how do we create a child fatality review process, for example, that's not about, you know, you're going to come to a meeting and sit before a panel and you're going to prove to us why you aren't responsible for a kid's death. That goes on in child welfare systems. That's not, that's a shaming and blaming model that doesn't motivate safe behavior or help systems learn. Okay, I have a couple more questions uh, and uh, comments as well. Um, one of our regional administrators, Laura Schatzberger, which is seconded by another regional administrator, Musein Balaban. Um, their comments are, having been part of your original visit to LA, I'm thrilled to see that we are continuing to emphasize and prioritize the growth of this effort. Shout out to RMD, Risk Management Division, and to CQI, Continuous Quality Improvement, for lighting our way. Then we have a question from TL, who is part of our research section. Can you please elaborate on your best tips for child welfare on avoiding the fundamental attribution error with families and community partners? Yeah, so I, I'm going to talk. I, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have if you hadn't asked me that. Spoken specifically to fundamental attribution error more broadly. But when I talk later about those team-based tools, like the field guide that I've been referencing and the idea of developing habits, um, that that's. That, I'll, I'll come. I'll circle back to your question because that's that's really the tools that help you um, mitigate sort of fundamental attribution error. Um, you know, the the way to overcome. Your, these biases is to have some team process like a huddle that helps you come together and talk about what you're concerned about out loud so your team can help you make a better decision. Okay, great. Really simple Before stuff too, really not complicated stuff. Great. Uh, before turning it over to Sylvia to see if anyone has raised their hand, my last question is from Christine Liberian. When speaking of accountability, is this regarding accountability for the parent slash family as well? I'm really talking specifically about an accountability model in an organization, like how we think about professional accountability. Um, I think there's a lot of parallel process that you can find between developing the kind of organizational culture we're talking about and, and approaching our colleagues in the same way that we would approach our families, right? So things like fundamental attribution error and hindsight bias are important to the way we understand how professionals work in our system, but also important to the way we think about the decisions that a mom made in the course of, you know, trying to uh, raise a kiddo. So I think there are a lot of parallels, but when I'm talking about accountability, I'm talking about the kind of accountability models we build, how we hold each other accountable, how we hold our system accountable. Oh, cool. Somebody used the puddles in Lancaster. Puddles are so, so cool. And Sylvia, do we have no raise hands? Yeah, no, there's none. Okay, um, one final question before we move on to our next uh, activity. Um, this is from Carla H. How do you differentiate FAE with cultural bias? Yeah, so I, 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 they're different. So um, all the biases I listed are, are the, the ones I list are the ones that we encounter most and, and that we think like quality improvement specialists um, need to be in, like tuned into when they're thinking about professional decision making. They can all actually be implicit or explicit. Um, cultural bias would be could be added to that list. It's another really important bias, obviously, that we need to understand, and it can sometimes be implicit and it can sometimes be explicit. So um, they're they're different in that the fundamental attribution error is this idea that I um, they're probably a little related because culture could be one of the things I attribute your behavior to. I could have attributed um, uh, that really goofy thing that that Director Kegel did to his culture. Um, but but I generally generally think about it that would just be one thing among many like his his intent or his training or you know how smart he was or all those kinds of things is typically what we attribute it to. But actually, I think they could be very related. I think a cultural bias could be a part of your 
uh, your difficulty and what you attribute someone's behavior to. Actually, it's probably, yeah. um, as I say that out loud, it probably is, they're very much related and overlapping. 